Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Karo Khan vs Everything series. It's been a while since we've made a video on this series, so if you're new to the channel, you maybe haven't watched the previous episode, the playlist will be linked below. You can go and watch the previous episodes now, or you can watch this one and then go watch them. With that being said, this series is essentially a rapid rating climb where I'm going to 2000 ELO if possible over an extended period of time. And whether I have the white or the black pieces, I play a Karo Khan-esque setup, avoiding the London, of course. And just talking you through my moves while we play, having a bit of fun, throwing in a bit of education along the way. And I hope you guys enjoy. With that being said, let's get into the game. Okay, so we're playing against Tiberiu344 from, I believe that's Romania. And we can just go ahead and pre-move the Karo Khan because we will be playing it regardless of what he does. And it is viable, regardless of what white does. You can play c65 against basically everything, and you're going to be fine. My opponent goes for the advanced variation. I personally like to go c5. You can play bishop to f5 in these systems, and then go for like e6, maybe h6 to drop the bishop back to h7. But like ideas like the tile attack from the white side can be kind of annoying to deal with, I've found against um bishop f5 setup so i'm not really a fan of it i instead go for this put pressure on the center immediately my opponent goes c3 to support the center so we're just going to put more pressure on if white ever takes on c5 he'll be severely weakening the e5 pawn and also we should be able to win c5 back without too much problem knight f3 i like to meet with bishop to g4 of course this knight is fighting for the dark squares my bishop can't fight for the dark squares because it's a light squared bishop but by proxy it can fight for the dark squares by pinning the knight, which is on a light square, but controlling dark squares, because knights control the squares opposite of the color that they're currently on. Of course, they can switch which color complex they're looking at, but they'll always be situated on the opposite color complex to the one that they're looking at, if you get what I mean by that. Uh, bishop to b5, I think e6 is a perfectly valid move here, just to uh, defend this pawn. I'm just going to move my mic a little bit. Hope that didn't break anyone's eardrums. And, I mean, this is just a very typical Karo Khan setup. I'm sure we've probably had this in previous episodes of the Karo Khan vs. Everything series, or even in, like, the Rapid Rating Climb or Blitz series that I've done. This is just a very common way that the advanced Karo Khan goes, because in the same way that I'm using my light square bishop to pin his knight fighting for the center, he's doing the exact same thing to me, except this is more of an absolute pin because there's a king here and there's a queen there. So my opponent can move this knight. Might be a bad idea, but he can, and I literally can't move my knight. So do I'm pinning his knight. He's absolutely pinning my knight. Bit of a difference. Um, I think knight e7 is the idea here. Even though it looks like I'm giving up the c5 pawn, I believe I can just go knight to g6. Or maybe if knight e7 takes, maybe take the knight first and then go knight to g6. Because you can't defend e5 and c5 at the same time. This knight can come to f5 as well to put pressure on d4 if my opponent decides not to take on c5, which is probably the better way for him to go. Knight d2 is a common idea in these lines to support this knight and allow the queen to move away we have had a few games i believe in this playlist where my opponent has moved the queen away too early allowed the doubling of the pawns and just got an absolutely slaughtered on the king side so my opponent does take i th i think this is the right idea knight g6 if knight g6 and he does something like this then we can probably just take. Yeah. It can be scary if white does give up the e5 pawn to support the c5 pawn and build up a big blob of pawns on the queen side because it is effectively four versus two, which has gotten me into a lot of trouble in games that I've played in the past. But it's not necessarily that scary if you as the black pieces don't push your pawns too far forward that's generally what i've found to be a theme with that kind of setup where if you do try to start challenging the white pawns with moves like a5 and b6 then they can start getting through 
Now, moves like A5 and B6 are viable in some positions, but you have to be very careful with them because it could allow your opponent to just bypass your pawns and create a passer. Whereas if you leave the pawns on their home squares, it can be a lot more difficult for white to actually create that overload. And even if he does manage to do that, he might just end up with an isolated C pawn or something, like an isolated double C pawn, which is potentially not scaring anybody. It's just a bit of a theme to be aware of in these positions. Um, but knight g6 really is just a simple double attack. Now, yes, there is there are other pieces fighting for the e5 square, but remember, this knight is pinned and this knight is pinned. So these knights are not really participating in the attack or defense of e5. Therefore, e5 is attacked once and c5 is attacked once. Now, white technically can defend both, with queen to d4, but then I would take the knight, double the pawns, like I mentioned before, and that is typically very bad for white. So he goes knight d2, which is probably a good option. If I take, he can always take back with the knight now. I'm just going to take on c5. I could take on e5, but I don't think I want to. Here, I'm kind of just forced to take on f3, so we're going to do it. The reason I took on c5 rather than e5 I'm not sure if it is necessarily the best way to go about it, but I feel like e5 is incredibly weak because of the lack of a d-pawn, whereas c5 can be supported by b4 quite easily and create this kind of pawn structure, which, again, like I was mentioned before, I do often find kind of scary to deal with. So I'm just going to castle, break this pin. I am now threatening to take on e5 because my knight is now obviously participating in the game. Um. I wouldn't be surprised if my opponent tries to just take the knight and get rid of it, but I don't think that's really the best way to go about the position for the white pieces. I think it's probably better, well, I would say bishop f4 to drop it back to g3 to support e5, but of course he can't do that with my knight on g6. A lot of the time the knight is on f5, in which case white can do this, but in this situation he can't. I may try and get my queen out to b6, especially if there's a trade here and make use of the b-file. What? Knight g5. I assume he wants to go f4, but can't we just take? Isn't that just giving up a pawn for no reason? Bruv. Knight e5, the only thing I can think is queen h5 going after h7. But I can take with this knight as well, if queen h5, h6. I don't understand. If I take with this knight, everything is well defended. This bishop is undefended, but white can't access the bishop. Unless he's trying to do something like here, here. I retreat and then he goes f5 try and blast open the king side but he can't do that because of the pin on the pawn anyway so i'm really not sure what my opponent's plan here is here is is here i'm not sure what my opponent's plan is here this just seems like a simple blunder of a pawn because queen 2 h5 doesn't do anything it, it just doesn't do anything i don't think yeah, I mean, we just blocked the queen's access to h7, we attack the knight, the knight has to retreat. I mean, it's only got one square to go to, and then we can just trade and be up a pawn for nothing, which sounds like a very good deal to me. Sounds like a great deal. And we still have ideas like queen b6 to put pressure on f2 and attack b2. Well, we're not attacking either because they're both defended, but we just put pressure on. I can't draw arrows. Oh, that was not what I was supposed to do. My mouse has got some annoying buttons on the side that go backwards and forwards. And I just accidentally click them sometimes, as you just witnessed. But we're back, we're back. And yeah, it, it, he just has to retreat. I'm not really sure what his plan was here. I'm really not sure. Yeah. Our knight is technically under attack. We could go queen to f6 to defend the knight it's attacked twice defended once right and it's not necessarily the best idea to allow his queen on f3 because it could be an active square if we go queen f6 
95. We could just go queen e5 and offer a queen trade. And then if queen f3, we have the same position, except my queen is on e5, which is a lot more active. Then we can maybe play moves like bishop d6 to threaten mate and maybe induce weaknesses. So I think I like that. Queen f6. I think I like this. We're, we, we want to trade, but we want to trade on our terms. Because also, if white doesn't do anything here, then we're going to take. And because we have the queen attacking as well, we're going to ruin his pawn structure, which will make the position far more winning than it already is. Because we definitely have an advantage for upper pawn, right? We have a very nice dark squared bishop. Our knights are doing a good job in the center. We have a very strong pawn formation in general and in terms of controlling the center. But now my opponent allows me to just completely ruin his, um, his kingside structure which means that even though we're up a pawn, it's far worse than that for white because he's going to have to try and hold on to his crippled kingside formation whilst being down a pawn. If you're down a pawn in chess, right, and you can't win it back, you need to prioritize peace activity. What's going to happen now is that we're going to cripple his kingside and then I'm going to play knight to h4 to go after the f3 pawn and he's going to have to play moves like bishop to e2 to defend himself that is not peace activity that is peace passivity right i guess that's like kind of a, a fancy way of saying it but it's so passive like i was saying if you're down material you need activity but what i'm going to do is put so much pressure on these kingside pawns that my opponent is going to be essentially forced to be passive. So I think that's probably the most clinical way of going about this position. Now after bishop e2, of course king g2 can't be played to defend because the knight controls that square, and it's very difficult for, for white to actually kick this knight out because bishop g5 can't be played and rook e4 can't be played, right? Now the issue is I have no obvious ways to get my rooks in the game. Because my only open file is the C file, except the C3 pawn is very strong. So I think what my idea should be is to play D4 to open things up. So I'm going to prepare that with rook FD8, and then I want to play D4. Could I have played it immediately? Maybe. Maybe, but there's no rush. I could also play rook A to C8 to further pre prepare this. Because if d4 gets played, then squares like c2 are going to become active if this pawn gets traded off. But again, in this position, black is not only up a pawn. Black not only has a far better structure than white, but I'm also trying to create a scenario where black has far more active pieces as well. I want to situate the rooks on d8 and c8. I want the bishop on this long diagonal, this knight. Is restricting his king, his bishop, and his kingside pawns. They can't really do a whole lot. Opponent offers me a trade. I'm just going to go rook c8. Because if I take... His structure still isn't great, but it's improved. So if he wants to trade on my terms, then go for it. To be fair, I could have played d4 here. But, again, there is no rush. I'm the one that decides if the d file gets opened or not. Okay, my opponent might be trying to play king to g3, but then I have knight f5 check. I could go bishop to d6 to force the king back, but then d4 becomes difficult to play. So maybe I'm just going to go d4 now. And if this happens, then I do this. And, I mean, white still has all of his problems. He might be able to get this bishop out if he can force my knight to move, but this bishop has no obvious target. Mainly because of my Karo Khan pawn structure, where you set up really strong on the dark squares. Let's take on d4. If he wants to trade, then perfect. If he doesn't, I, again, I don't really want to help him improve his structure. I might play knight f5 to try and force him to take me by putting extra pressure on the bishop and defending my own. But again, I don't know if I want to make his structure better. And if I do go knight f5, then this bishop no longer has to defend the f3 square. So worth bearing in mind. I do now have access to the c file, which is great. b2 is under attack. 
Okay, opponent goes rook to g1. The idea is that bishop to h6 is now a threat because the g-pawn is pinned. Knight f5 might be quite a clinical way of dealing with this. I can also consider rook to c2. Trying to play on the weakness of the second rank. <clears throat> and if this bishop moves to a bad square, then knight to f3 could be an idea. If rook c2, bishop d1, bishop e3, bishop c2, knight f3, check. Mm, I think I have too many pieces hanging there. I could take, take, and rook c2. White probably has to go rook e1 to defend. And then we go rook d2. And white is in some big trouble on the second rank. Yes, I undouble his pawns. But by making this pawn move to the third rank, I'm exposing the weakness of his second rank. My knight is still making it difficult for white to defend himself properly. And I remove the threat on my king side, making my job a lot easier. I think I'm going to play rook d2 first. I don't think it actually matters in which order, but I'm just going to play rook d2 first, just because this is a dark square, so it's not vulnerable to the light squared bishop in any way, shape, or form. I know the light squared bishop can't move, but who knows what could happen five moves down the line, right? Who knows? Better to be safe than sorry, especially since it seems to not really matter which rook I move. Um, if you would have moved the c rook, again, it doesn't. It probably doesn't matter. I did see this. Um, I can either take the bishop, allow king h4, and take on e3, or I can potentially play knight to f5, allow king f2 to defend the bishop, rook c2, rook e1, and then I'm not sure how I push the advantage. I could just take pawns and claim my opponent's position is very cramped, which might be a good way of going about the position. Again, I could do this, which is more simple, but then maybe white actually has some play. So I'm actually just going to go knight f5. This might not be the best way to handle the position, right? But what I'm trying to do is restrict white and not allow him to do anything. That kind of just is my play style. And I like to suck all the life out of my opponent's position to make it very difficult for them to do anything that could compromise mine. I, I, I just like playing chess like that. Um, maybe I'm just a horrible person, but that's what I like to do. I'm going to go rook c to c2, put even more pressure on the bishop and the king. One of these rooks is going to have to come to e1, or he's going to just lose his bishop. Now, luckily for white, I can't go knight d4 to apply even more pressure, which would just win a piece because of this pawn. He moves the e rook, sorry, the g rook, which is probably better. I'm going to take on b2. White can't do anything. He can play king to f1, but then I get knight g3 check, and he just loses. And also, he would hang the e3 pawn, but, I mean, winning a piece is probably better. Yeah, and e3, sorry, e4 is a bit of a I'm frustrated move from my opponent, because all it does is allow my knight to the square that it wanted to go to all along, and was being prevented from going to by the e3 pawn. E4 is just a sim simply a dopamine move to try and attack something. But all it does is relinquish defense of d4, allow me to win his bishop, because the bishop is pinned and this rook can't help in the defense. And now I'm just up two pawns and a knight, which is obviously completely winning. My opponent gives up his rook for the knight, which is fine by me. We're going to take the pawn. Um, and this game is basically over. I expect my opponent to resign pretty soon. Although he might just play on to be annoying. We'll see. Uh, let's just go rook dc2. Offer him a trade. Yeah, of course he's not going to accept it. So we're going to give this check and force his king out. Put it on a vulnerable square. Let's go f6 to further restrict the king's movement. Give a check. Um, wait, is this just mate? No, here, here. 
So if I give this check here and then here, then it's made. Because we cut him off here, we cut him off here, and we're cutting him off here. And now F5 is checkmate. So, I mean, just a very clean game. I think that just shows the power of the Karo Khan because we were never in trouble at any point in that game. I'm going to run a very quick sort of 5-10 minute analysis using the help of the engine. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you don't want to stick around for the analysis, I would encourage you to do so. But if you don't want to, then there will be a playlist linked below with all of my videos from this Karo Khan series, the Karo Khan versus everything series. But there'll also be a playlist of every single video on my channel that features the Karo Khan. So again, if you want to see Karo Khan videos, check those out. If you want to see the rest of the series, check that out. I would encourage you to stick around for the analysis though. Let's get into that now. Okay, so game review gives 77.3% accuracy for my opponent and 91.1 .1 for myself. So those accuracies, are of, they're a little bit inflated just because the game was kind of short, but still indicates how easy the Karo Khan is to play, in my opinion. So let's get into the analysis. We have e4, c6, d4, d5. White can do a whole lot of things here. He chooses the advanced variation. If you want to see what happens in other variations, again, check the playlist below. We have c5 to immediately challenge the center. c3, knight c6, knight f3, bishop g4, bishop b5, e6, supporting c5, castle. And here, I went knight e7, which is apparently a mistake. Queen b6 gives the advantage to black. I guess because this bishop is under attack and can't be defended with a knight to c3. Also can't be defended with queen to a4 because then this knight will get taken and the pawns will be doubled. And we already saw how big of a problem that was, even without queens on the board. So imagine how big of an issue it would be to have these pawns doubled with queens on the board, meaning that white would have to exchange his bishop for the knight and after something like knight bd two cd4 cd4 black is apparently just better after knight e7 probably coming to f5 to put pressure on d4 interesting white plays the best move though after knight e7 dc5 i assumed this was good for black after knight to g6 now apparently knight bd2 is an inaccuracy it's better for white to take and then he has to find queen a4 which is a common idea in these Karo positions, trying to exploit the weakness of the bishop and the weakness of the diagonal here. But black would have no choice but to go into this line. Check, king e8, gf3, knight e5, and bishop to f4. And the material... Well... In can the king do this? Oh, he just gets checked back. And if he comes to h3, then it's defended anyway. This is apparently just like a very, very weird position. Of course, the king doesn't have to come wandering out. The king could go to h1, which is what the engine prefers. And then I guess we just have a bit of a scrap on our hands in this position, which I don't know if I would give plus 0.6 to white here. I suppose white has a passed pawn. He may be down a pawn. His king is kind of weak, but my king can't castle. Very interesting position. He goes for knight bd2, though, which allows... Whoa, bishop c5 is a miss. Again, this queen a4 idea, which I just completely missed. I should be playing knight e5 or bishop f3 first, which I did consider, but I didn't do. And now if queen a4 is played, then I can just take, and the knight supports this knight. So if knight f3, I can take here a check, and then probably play like queen c7 or something. Although queen c7 is met with bishop to f4, supported by the queen, so probably like queen d7. Followed by like, I don't know, maybe a6 and rook c8, or bishop takes and castle. Again, an interesting position where white has a lot of pressure, but his structure is also ruined. What happened in our game, though, is that his structure was ruined, 
but he didn't have the pressure. After bishop c5, white needs to find this queen a4 idea in conjunction with bishop to c6. Fortunately for me, he didn't. He allows this trade, a castle. Knight g5 is just a massive mistake. It's just a terrible move. Um, queen e2 is the best idea, to just to support this pawn, which makes a lot more sense to me. And then it's pretty much equal. Moves like queen c7 apply more pressure. Rook e1 apply more defense. The game goes on. My opponent chooses knight g5, though, which I just did not understand for the life of me. I take. I took with the c knight so that uh, bishop takes c6 was not an option. Queen h5, I mean, the computer just wants white to retreat, which I mean, humans are not just going to retreat like that. They're going to stick to their guns, but h6 just counters absolutely everything. If I don't have h6, then I'm in trouble, but I do. Knight goes back. And I could have taken on f3, but I chose queen to f6, which is actually the best move in the position, because it basically forces white to take here i could take with the knight or the queen taking with the knight is better i was going to take with the queen just to offer a trade because this is just easier to convert with queens off the board but my opponent instead just chose to play rookie one which was very very odd of course i just ruin his structure knight h4 applies pressure forces bishop to e2 it's the only valid way to defend rook f to d8 a computer wanted rook f to c8 I don't really know why. And let's say, I don't know, bishop e3 like my opponent did in the game. He wants g5, I mean... <laughs> Alright then. Alright, I, I, I'm very happy with the plan I played. I don't care if the computer thinks it's bad. Well, not bad, but suboptimal. Bishop e3. Here, to be fair, I, d4 is the best move. But I chose rook a c8, which is still good. King h2 is just a bit of a waste of time. We go d4. Takes, takes, rook g1. And here, here I was trying to come up with the best idea because I didn't want to allow any counterplay at all. The three moves that I considered are the top three moves, being bishop e3, knight f5, and rook c2. I did actually end up playing all of those moves in the game, but the move I chose was bishop to e3, which I think was the most clinical way to tackle the position because you can just calculate this. You know what's going to happen. Here, g5 is the best move defending the knight. Which, I mean, I get it. I get it. But it feels like I'm complicating the position unnecessarily. So instead, I decided on knight f5. Because I can calculate a clear series of moves. White only has one option. I have one option. White has one option. And then it's easy. Even though this might not be the absolute best line, it's so easy for me to calculate because there's only one string of moves. I mean, he could have moved either, either rook to e1, but it doesn't really change anything. I know that in this position, I can look into the future, see this position, and be like, yeah, this is winning. So just go for it. Don't complicate things. e4 just loses the game on the spot to knight d4, and we all know how that goes. He just gives a rook for no reason. We try to trade rooks, he declines. And then I try to push the king out into the center because it makes it easier for me to checkmate it. And here, rook c4 is the most clinical. f4 apparently does lead to mate. If I find b5, trying to prepare this. Rook d3, rook a4, king e3, and f4. Which again, is quite a pretty mate because um, the king is just cut off by his own pieces and my rooks. We find um, the more clinical way, rook c4, rook d4, and f5 checkmate. And a pawn checkmate always feels good at the end of the day. The Karo Khan shines again. We have a very nice game, very clinical. I hope it was very useful for you guys and maybe even entertaining along the way. Check out the other videos on my channel. There'll be some kind of playlist or video appearing on the screen now. Click it because it will be good. If you enjoyed this, you'll enjoy the video showing up. Thank you very much for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video.